Hi, this is Nan. This is Kathy. And this is our second pin making video. So we already made a pin video. It got pretty good views, but um, it was too long. Not and it was, edited at all. <laughs> and it was too boring. So we wanted to um, try to do a remix and see if we could do a better job this time. So um, what's the purpose of this pin video? Uh, we, first of all, we want to demystify the process of making pins. Uh, we wanted to give you some transparency to how we made pins from design all the way through to selling it and hopefully inspire some of you to make uh, to make your own pins if you if you have some good ideas but are intimidating about the process. Yeah, so um, we went through the process of making pins, so hopefully we can impart some of this, um, mm -hmm. some of what we learned to you. So let's... Uh, so we kind of broke it down into a couple different um, steps. So first is um, designing your pin. Um, the second step is manufacturing your pin. And the third uh, main section will be how to sell your pin. So let's uh, dive into the design section. So when designing your pin, um, it has a couple of uh, steps to designing your own pin. And um, first is um, con making a concept. Uh, second is actually rendering the design. Uh, third is uh, adding colors to it, and fourth is choosing the materials. So um, let's get to uh, the concept. So, um, Kathy, like, what are some call-outs with um, developing a concept for a pin? So if you have an idea already um, what pin to make, um, I recommend going online and researching what's already out there. If you see that the concept you're thinking of has already been overly done, it's not that I don't think you should do it, but I think you should provide your own spin to it. Obviously, if you're already an illustrator or designer and you have your, your own style that um, certain people might be drawn to, but if you're not a, an artist and you're thinking about hiring an artist to do something, I recommend coming up with a pin idea that uh, hasn't been done before. So I'll show you an example of what I mean. Um, and the concept, so this is the, one of the first concepts I came up with. It's the black sheep warrior, where in context of a yoga sheep, uh, not yoga sheep, uh, yoga pose. Um, there hasn't been, there isn't a lot of yoga pins out there. I've looked on Etsy and on Instagram. And um, I actually did a series of yoga animal poses in watercolor, and I thought it would be a fun concept to explore in pin form. So I um, I made this a black sheep warrior because it's kind of has a double meaning. It's got a double entendre of being a black sheep, but also a warrior, and also it's uh, doing a yoga pose. And it's actually my best selling pin so far. So I'm not saying you should also make it really deep for each, all of your pins because not all of my pins are that deep. Like this one is a jackass penguin, which is an African penguin. It's just another name for Af African penguins. And I really like penguins personally. And I thought that they might be cool to, they might look cool as pins. I uh, also like the jackass part of it, obviously. So <laughs> these are just a couple of concepts. Um, all I'm saying is do some research. Don't be basic. Don't copy other people's ideas. And definitely don't copy other artists' art. And also, like, also when you find something that you think is unique, it's just good to do research against that design to see if it's already been done before. To just validate, to say, OK, there's a niche a niche here that something somebody hasn't done done yet mm -hmm. and um, this product is unique and might be able to sell better because it is unique. Yes. After you come up with your concept then you actually have to draw or render it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a diff couple different what, uh, methods to render it. Um, to just walk through the ones that I know it's uh, one is to either draw it on a piece of paper and then put it in your scanner and scan it, and then you can put it on Photoshop and um, start doing the next steps. Or Illustrator or iPad, whatever your choice of digital rendering tool is. Yeah, and then the other way that I would know how to um, render or design your pen is to do it um, directly into uh, either an iPad device or a tablet or a, a Wacom, one of those tools. Yeah. Um, I think, Kathy, your preference at this point is to use a Wacom. Yeah, I definitely hand draw it first. It's just 
I'm more comfortable with sketching it out with a pencil first and scan it in and digitally draw over it. But you don't need to vectorize it. If you don't know what that means, forget I even talked about it. Um, a lot of the manufacturers actually have in-house design team that will help render your art into a enamel pin mock-up. They should do that actually, so um, set that expectation with them up front. And um, in terms of what you need to send them to produce the pins, we can go over that next. After you actually get your two-dimensional line drawing into the computer, the next thing you have to think about is what colors you want it. Mm -hmm. So, um, any call-outs on coloring? Well, the most important thing about color, if you haven't paid a lot of attention to pins, is they all use uh, solid colors. So, there's an outline, and within the outline, it um, you have to designate how you want the machine, the pin-making machine, to pour the color into it. So, they can't do paint, hand paint, or watercolor-like effects. Everything has to be in its own designated color, and that color needs to be designated to a Pantone code. So, which brings us to the next tool we use. This fancy schmancy Pantone color bridge coded guide is obviously the preferred source for finding Pantone colors because it will tell you exactly how the color is going to show up on the pins. It's not necessary because it's freaking expensive and I actually didn't use it to make any of these pins because I just bought this. But, but um, basically, color is a freaking language. So what happens is that Kathy makes this pig yoga pin, uh, pin that's pink and she has to make sure that the pink that she drew out here is the same pink here that shows up on her computer here and is sent over to the factory there so that they see the same same pink so it ends up in this pin here the same the, the, the same pink. Yeah. Um, we didn't have access to Pantone colors before and um, we uh, I think some of the colors did come out um, we were still able to sell the pins but um, it was the variance was enough that we had to invest in a set of Pantones so that we could make sure that um, our quality would be uh, would, would, would be able to uh, be better. What are you talking about? Forward. They were the perfect colors. <laughs> I was the perfect <laughs> color picker <laughs> on my screen. Yeah, yeah. Everything, Don't everything, our secrets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything came out just as planned, right? Just as planned, of course. <laughs> Yeah, so that's uh, that's that's the coloring. So um, after you've colored your design, the next part is to choose the materials. So what do they mean by materials? What do you mean by materials? Yeah, so let's let's jump into the actual pins so we can talk about the materials a little bit. I think what you meant by material is the overall packaging or how the pin looks like. Um, there are actually two types of pin, enamel pin, one is soft, one is hard. Soft enamel pin, enamel pin like this one has textured surface to it, so the plating, the outline, um, is actually raised and the rest of it is not, and it pours colors into the, between the plating. The hard enamel pin has a smooth surface to the touch, so they pour a layer of resin over it and it's supposed to be more durable, um, but and it's less prone to scratches, so it does cost a little bit more to make them. I personally think it depends on the design you're going for. This is pretty cool for if you want to show off a lot of different details and texture. Uh, this one's just cool because it looks more modern. I think uh, the hard enamel pins mm -hmm. um, cost more, right? No, the soft, uh, oh yes, the hard. This one, this, the hard costs just a little more than the soft. the soft. Okay. Yeah. And then other things to consider is uh, the plating, right? Yeah, the plating color. So here it's gold, which is the color of the outline. And this one is rose gold. Rose gold costs also costs a little more just because it's fancy sounding and it's kind of a trendy color these days. Um, black and gold, in my experience, cost the same. And we can talk more about yeah. what effects cost and, and, and just, all of that. That's that's what they mean. This is the backing right here. The, yeah, this so black the, part right the here. plating goes all the way to the back. So the back yeah. of the pin will And have then the also we part. have to 
talk about the back right here. That's another decision you have to make. These are uh, rubber backs, right? Yep, they're the most economical. They're the cheapest. I actually like them just fine. Um, a lot of pins come with the gold backing. The gold backing tend to fall out. I think they loosen up over time if you have to pin between different things and they tend to fall out for me so I like the rubber backing uh, they don't really stretch out the third option is a, a locking a metal locking back oh yeah those are really difficult to use but I think they're they hold better over time right they do hold the best uh, you can even start with the rubber backing and buy like a hundred locking pin backs on eBay or Amazon for pretty cheap if you can't make up your mind right now but rubber backing usually comes uh, default with the uh, manufacturer's pricing. After you've made all those decisions about your design and you've made the concept, you've rendered it, picked the colors and picked the materials, now you have to make the dang thing. So mm -hmm. um, when you go to manufacturing, um, we're going to break these into different parts. So first is um, how to find your manufacturer. Second is uh, what to ask your manufacturer, and then we'll get into the manufacturing process. Yeah, so I think that's the part people don't really talk about, or we haven't seen any resources when we try to make our pins. So we have to Frankenstein different things together and hoping that it works. So we just want to make it super easy for you so that you know exactly what to expect when you communicate with the manufacturer. Well, I want to talk about it. <laughs> well, if you can't talk about it, let's we'll see. Yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay, so um, the first thing is like, how do you find your manufacturer? So finding a manufacturer is kind of like dating. You have to look online on a web page, or you can get a referral. Are you saying you're telling them to go on Tinder to look <laughs> for a pin manufacturer? Uh, not Tinder, but they're the Tinder of manufacturers, which, which is. is... Alibaba or Alibaba Express. So um, tell me your experience about going to the world of Alibaba and searching for pin making. I got lucky in that we actually got a referral from a friend who owns a business and sells pins. She referred us to her pin manufacturer. She originally found them on Alibaba though, so that's always a viable option. Um, I would recommend contacting a handful of them and getting a quote. Uh, initially, because maybe you're not sure exactly what you're looking for, um, looking to make, you can provide them some rough uh, estimate on how, like, what kind of pin you want to make, and they'll give you an estimate in return. So, want to tell them what quantity you want, roughly what size, uh, soft versus hard, all of that stuff, and they'll give you a quote. And I mean, cost is one thing, but you also want to make sure the quality is up to your standard. So I do recommend getting a sample. Uh, it could be a sample of a design that you already have, which is going to extend the time, the lead time. Or you can ask them for pins that they've already made so you can see in person if the quality is um, meets your expectation. Yeah, so just make sure you look at their reviews, make sure they have good user feedback. And then just to recap what Kathy said, uh, when you um, get an initial quote from them, make sure uh, you put in the quantity. Demet uh, make sure you ask for um, pricing based on quantity, um, dimensions, shipping, and um, ask for samples. Yeah, include shipping costs because that I factor shipping costs into my final cost per pin. Yeah, and that's like super important. So um, after you get that information and you select a manufacturer and you take that um, leap of faith, um, the next thing that you have to do is you have to actually submit your design to them. So when you submit your design to them, then we have to use something called a spec sheet. This was the black sheet pin that I made uh, that I showed you earlier, and this is the spec sheet I sent the manufacturer. This sheet was made in PowerPoint because that's the tool I am most proficient in. Oh, I can do, you can use Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, whatever, whichever program you're most uh, familiar with, but I just find PowerPoint the easiest to plot things together. So some of the things to include is obviously the Pentone color code, uh, annotate each color that you want to the parts, to the corresponding part of the design. So this is a JPEG image that I rendered digitally, it could just be JPEG file that, this could be the file that you send to the manufacturer, but I pasted it here for this purpose, for this spec purpose. Here I 
designated the dimensions, so the height and the width of the block sheet. Make sure that it's in uh, millimeter or centimeter because if you're dealing with overseas supplier, they use a metric system. Uh, you don't want to leave anything open to interpretation or have to make them calculate anything. Uh, it's just better for both of you. I also um, assign which what type of pin I want, soft or hard. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, make sure that you tell them what color you want the gold plating is, even though my drawing is not gold. Um, here I told them that I'm telling them to make it into gold plating. And this is not the, the last thing you see. Obviously, we said earlier, you're going to expect a mock-up from them in return. So they're going to give you a digital mock-up of what the pin looks like. It's going to look less flat than this drawing right here. So make sure you examine everything to make sure that the code matches. All the color codes matches, match uh, what you have sent them. Here's another more complicated design of the jackass penguin that I showed earlier. So one thing I just want to call out here is that originally in my spec sheet, I didn't tell them to die cut this part here under his left armpit. And they came back with a mock-up with this part in white. So next time I sent them the spec sheet, I'll make sure to tell them that this part needs to cut out. It does cost incrementally more to cut out this piece, but to me it affects the final look and I decided to pay for it. Um, one thing that, especially when dealing with overseas manufacturers, is to never um, to always be specific and never make assumptions, <laughs> never leave anything up open to interpretation. Um, if you do, then unfortunately that's on you. So it's kind of like programming a computer. Yeah. Anything that happens, you have to be very specific. Because once they're made, they're made. <laughs> so after you um, you submit your design to them and your spec sheet, what happens after that? So after you submit all your artwork and you receive a mock-up back, that's when they'll give you, sometimes before or after mock-up, they'll give you a final quote on how much everything's going to cost. It depends on the manufacturer, sometimes they may give you a quote earlier than that. And if you're okay with that final quote, um, you'll have to pay for them to start producing. From the point you submit the artwork, I would expect three to four week turnaround. It's never taken less than three weeks for me. Um, and usually it's four weeks until you receive the product, especially if it's from overseas, because it's going to take about a week to ship to your house. So plan, definitely plan ahead if you have an upcoming event or some kind of holiday or sale that you're preparing for. And just in general, I would say try to plan at least a month in advance. And one thing you might want to consider is um, packaging. So let's um, talk a little bit about um, how you want to package it. So in looking at the packaging, you have a couple options. One is that you can just get the pin individually without no, um, any backboard at all. But the thing is, is that if you end up selling your pins and you're going to have to individually attach each pin to the backboard, um, that will have your company logo and, a disc and, and the name of your pin, and that's yeah. like super annoying. I think it's just good presentation to have backboards. We've seen some pins being sold by themselves without the backboards, but I just think it's, you know, presentation matters, yeah. especially when, when it comes to these uh, little items. So and I've always have a, I always have a black backboard. Initially, when we first ordered our first set of pins, I didn't have a backboard. So for these backboards, we had to print and cut and assemble them ourselves, and it was a pain in the ass. Yeah. <laughs> we regret it. Yeah, uh, and we were doing it while watching Netflix, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what if you, uh, you know, so you, you can look at the quality of the ones that we ordered uh, from the manufacturer versus the ones that we made ourselves. So, I mean, that. I don't know. Uh, to, to us, like maybe this one doesn't look as the, the paper's not as nice as the um, as the fine art paper we use, but it, it looks fine to me because it saves so much time. Oh, it's actually really thick and durable too. This one has a gloss feel to it. It's a cardstock, so I actually like this one more. It's more durable. But obviously, yeah. this one's. More and um, when we actually get the pins, and it comes like this, already packaged in um, cellophane, so it protects the pin. Yeah. And um, it it looks it looks good.
And they also gave us um, extra backboards. Yeah, because um, they know some of them might get bent in transit. Yeah. So, and um, when you actually get your package, then it comes like this. Yeah. All full of pins. Yeah, and it saves us so much time so that you know, when we receive orders, we can just process them directly rather than having to poke holes into a backboard and assembling them ourselves. So now that you, um, you know, it's three or four weeks have passed and the, the pins show up in your front door and you're super excited, um, how do you sell the dang things? So there's a couple different um, avenues you can do. Uh, you, mean you don't just make them and they'll show up at your door wanting all your pins? <laughs> yeah, you can get uh, under pin and I just... thought if you make it, they'll show up. What? <laughs> or if you're like a TGI Fridays worker, then you can just put all the pins and flares on your suspenders and go to work. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can TGI do it. TGI Friday? Why yeah. not Red Lobster? Anyway. <laughs> no, no, they don't have flair there. TGI Friday is flair. So, gotcha. um, so there's a couple different ways to, to sell your pins. So um, first is Etsy um, or Amazon. Um, Any call, of those online marketplaces? Yeah. The, the call with Etsy is that they want you to sell stuff that you make yourself. But of course, like we don't make pins at home. We are using manufacturers. So Etsy um, has some certain like they have, uh, requirements that they have in order to validate your manufacturer, yeah, right? Yeah, they have pretty stringent ethical standards with uh, the type of makers or products that they're allowing to sell, which is good. So in my case, they want me to show proof that the manufacturing partner I use meets ethical standards. So it's, I have to show them proof of the, the business that I'm using, that I'm partnering with and photos of the factory to make sure that they're not employing child labor or conducting anything unethically. Yeah, a good thing they don't require that here, because, you know. <laughs> in the uh, US? <laughs> no, in, in this house. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, uh, next is if you don't, um, another channel you can sell is through uh, your own e-commerce site, uh, if you built it through uh, Squares, uh, Square, Squarespace. Oh, yeah, Squarespace or Shopify. Uh, personally, we use Shopify, so it's just another uh, product that we upload, and um, I think we advertised through Instagram and had a launch, so that was fun. Um, yeah, if you don't have a website currently, this is the first thing you're selling, then I would start with Etsy. It's a lot easier to set up. Yeah. And then um, next is uh, wholesale or consignment. So if you have a stockist or retailer that you sell to, then um, it, you can say, hey, I'm carrying pins now, and um, send them some free samples. Uh, they can take a look at it, and they'll order it. Yeah. Um, one call out is that um, pins usually sell for 10 or $12 um, retail. So if, you, um, if you're selling at wholesale, then expect that they'll want to pay about 5 to $6 for them wholesale. Usually wholesale will cut the, yeah, the, they will buy at 50% of the suggested retail price. So a $10 pin that we sell online will sell to the wholesaler at $5 per pin. So we want to make sure that the margin's still worth it for us to do that if, um, yeah. Yeah, if we're going to sell it. So, I mean, if your pins cost uh, $5 to make, then you'll be making zero profit. If they only make uh, cost like a dollar to make, then you'll be making $4 profit. Which is kind of why we went with the Alibaba manufacturer route, because they are going to be cheaper than some of the other pin makers out there who, you know, if you do a search on Google, anything on the first page, they're probably going to cost anywhere between 2 to $4 to make a pin, and you have to make... I mean, they do small batches too, but if you only want to make 50, you're probably paying like three to four dollars. Well, one thing I wanted to talk about is kind of the risk of uh, making pins and, and going to a new product because, um, you know, Kathy usually makes watercolor prints or commissions or sells original artwork. Yeah. So, this um, little thing right here was the first time that we delved into the world of uh, physical products, and this is actually a 2D design. Um, line art. So it's like not something that Kathy was super uh, comfortable with. Um, yeah, it's not natural. my natural medium is watercolor and it doesn't translate that well to pins. I don't usually render anything in yeah. such precision. So it did take me a bit of a learning curve, um, but it was fun in the process. I think your the risk call you wanted to make is the investment, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it takes upfront money, but um, you know, I think 
one parting uh, advice that we want to leave to you is, um, you know, you're going to do your research, you're going to talk to people, um, you're going to watch this video, hopefully, um, to get some tips and advice, but um, also just believe in yourself and take that risk. Um, so um, when you made your first uh, investment, like how much did it cost and what did you do? It cost $500 to produce 400 pins. It was four different designs, 100 pieces. Yeah, and I think the four designs is just kind of, um, instead of going all in with one design, you kind of spread out different designs because and to see which ones will be more popular, right? Yeah. 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 If you're just doing this brand new, I mean, maybe you're lucky and it's just going to fly off the shelves. But for us, it did take a while to build up the momentum because people didn't associate me with selling pins. So if it's $500 for 400 pins, what's the price per unit? For that first set, each unit sold for sells for ten dollars each. So if I sold all of them, I would be making four thousand dollars at five hundred dollar cost. Yeah, and that's that's really not bad. And even the way that we kind of looked at it is that um, the worst case scenario, of course, is that she wouldn't sell even one of her pens. So she'd make zero dollars. Hey, I thought you're you're telling them to believe in themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You believe in me to sell one pin. I, I tell you that I believe in you, but I still have to like prepare for worst yeah, case. I have to prepare for the worst case yeah. scenario because I'm always like calculating risks. But um, I mean, I, just to emotionally, how I was able to uh, protect myself, I guess, is to think about the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario to me was that hey, maybe we don't sell even one freaking pin and we make yeah. zero dollars. But they spit for, in our face yeah. as they're looking at our pins but, at the craft fair. Yeah, yeah, but still, like the way I look at it is uh, it's kind of like when we pay for um, a workshop or a class or something like that. Sometimes you pay $500 just to take a class or to take some sort of physical mm -hmm. workshop and you, you don't get anything out of it. You just learn. So this mm -hmm. is kind of like... A learning experience on how to make this and at worst we would learn um, about this process and, and get some valuable experience out of it and that's kind of the way we approached it. And we're giving you this resource for free <laughs> so that you can save some money towards investing in these. Yeah and also um, save time. Um, yeah and maybe four thousand dollars doesn't seem like a lot because you have to go through all the trouble just to make 400 pins but everyone has to start somewhere and you make 400 now I've already made another, actually made another order of 500 pins in the last couple of months and I need to make another one. So it's just, it's about building momentum. And also we've seen some pins out there, we're not going to name names that are kind of crappy. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really about it. and I feel like these people are not shy about it. They're out there making pins and they're probably selling them if they're, if they're, they're keeping making them. So. If you're an illustrator, animator, whatever, and you think you have a good idea, and you know someone, either yourself or someone else, who can execute that idea well, and we trust that you have good taste, then like we want to see more quality pins out there. Like, yeah. We don't even care if you think my pins are crappy. We're just, <laughs> we're just we think there's we like to think in terms of like abundance. Like, if there's more talented. Design uh, designers out there who make pins and which just make the market yeah. more attractive. So um, keep on creating art and putting positive things out there in the universe. So uh, me and Kathy can sit back and hate on it. <laughs> That's just all you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Finally, <laughs> um, if there's anything that we haven't covered in the video that you want answered in this process, just leave us a comment or you can contact us through our YouTube channel or we'll also, update the all Yeah, and uh, thank you so much for um, your time, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks for watching.